News Presentation. Welcome to Interface here on SABC2. My name is Tembi Samachele, and this is the last time that we're going to be coming to you in this time slot. Remember, from next Sunday, the 9th of November, we'll be coming to you live on uh, SABC2 at 8.30 p.m., so please diarize that. Well, tonight on Interface, South African taxpayers, that's you and I, we're paying a whopping 8 million rand a month we're told, to run the Lindela Repatriation Center. Now, Lindela is a halfway house for illegal immigrants waiting for deportation. The center has been mired in controversy over human rights abuses over the years. And Home Affairs Minister Malusi Kikaba has promised to address the challenges, but he says the government is losing millions of rands, arresting, detaining, and deporting the immigrants, only for them to re-enter South Africa a little later on. Now, in Interface tonight, we ask, with its human rights track record, is South Africa sleeping when it comes to how we treat those that are in our care? And also, we are also asking, are our borders tight enough for the influx of migrants coming through to South Africa? And we are joined in the studio by Dr. Joe Very, who is a senior researcher at the African Center for Migration and Society, and that is at the University of the Witwatersrand. And we're also joined in the studio by the South African Human Rights Council's Gaudeng Prof provincial manager, Chantal Kisun, who is also with us here in studio. Thank you very much. Welcome to both of you. Thanks. Thank you for having us. I just want to start off with a quote that uh, came through from Amnesty International. They say South Africa, given where it comes from, had a very progressive refugee protection mechanism and policies. What we're seeing in recent times is an erosion of that. Would you agree with that? It's an interesting question, mm. I think. I think to varying degrees. I think there have been gains in, in certain respect. We've, we've strengthened certain areas. But certainly, uh, vulnerabilities have become clearer um, in more recent times. So you will find, for instance, that there is a more conscious um, monitoring and um, activism around um, how well we respect and protect uh, human rights. And so one would be hard pressed to say that there has been an absolute erosion. Mm. Um, there have been some weaknesses, uh, but there have also been some strengths. When it comes to Lindela, Chantal, we have heard over the years allegations of human rights abuses and all sorts of shenanigans happening there. And when you talk to the government, they tell you it's a well-run center. That's what the minister told us recently. Which of the two stories should we believe? Sure, I think um, with any type of detention facility um, anywhere in the world, um, it's a particular environment. It's a particularly um, vulnerable environment, and it, it's prone to have certain weaknesses and needs particular monitoring because of the very act of detaining somebody and uh, depriving them of liberty. Mm. So um, a state that is respectful of human rights would want to make sure that there is maximum protection of rights, but within this contained facility. And uh, the Human Rights Commission, for instance, and in this case, uh, together with civil society partners, um, investigated and monitored the center. And we certainly found some difficulties, um, and we found some really good things. Mm. Um, the, the idea was that we would work to strengthen what was in place and provide recommendations to the department to adopt uh, better mechanisms. I want us to talk about those recommendations a little later on mm. on the show, but I want to just bring you in, Joe, into this conversation. When you look at uh, the report from the Human Rights Commission, for example, about what's happening at Lindela, would you say that as a country we are slipping when it comes to our protection of human rights, or are they just isolated cases? And I think we need to recognize, as you were stating earlier that the South African Refugee Act is one of the most progressive refugee acts globally. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to recognize that and we need to look at the shortcomings that are currently taking place in terms of its implementation. 
and the way in which guidelines that are clearly outlined are perhaps not being implemented. And I think that's where we need to be focusing. I think we need to be understanding better what's going wrong and why. And I think that the Commission's report, you know, ACMS was involved in conducting the research for that. And we've done prior research um, at Lindella, also looking at a whole range of other processes associated with migration, access to asylum and so on. And I think what we're seeing is it's not necessarily that the policy is problematic, um, it's the way in which it's being implemented, and that there are parallel changes um, going on administratively, which are making it hard to ensure that the rights that are upheld are an out outlined in the, in, in the Refugee Act are being upheld. But where's the disconnect there? Because if you've got uh, <clears throat> a set of pro policies and principles that are good, mm -hmm. and yet when it comes to the implementation, the, the, there are some loopholes. Yeah, but I think that's exactly the, the challenge, and I think that's where we're seeing rights abuses taking place, is it's through incorrect delivery. So we've got a good legislative framework, but what we're seeing is individuals perhaps, for example, taking the case of Lindella, being detained illegally. So we're seeing cases of illegal deportations, for example. So we need to understand the role of detention, why detention is being used. We need to understand whether or not that's effective in achieving what the South yeah. African state is trying to achieve. And I think many of us would argue that perhaps the current processes in place at Lindella, um, sort of even if you put the human rights side aside, the costs involved are indicating that it's not managing um, to deal with the challenges the state feels it faces. Before we talk a little bit about the issue of costs, um, one of the things that the minister said was that no one has been detained at Lindela without a warrant. That's what the minister says. Are we to believe him? <laughs> it's a tough one, but I'm throwing it to either one of you. Sure, look, um, the commission, uh, as you know, is an independent body um, and works closely with civil society organizations and w as well. Uh, it, in protecting human rights, we receive complaints. And there have been complaints from people claiming that they had been detained for um, a period in excess of the 120 days, which is allowed in terms of the Immigration Act. Um, so that, that's problem number one. But in the course of this investigation, uh, the report released by the Commission, we certainly did find that um, quite a large number of people had been detained in, in excess of 120 days uh, permitted in terms of the mm -hmm. Immigration Act. So um, it appears there are people who are being detained. Um, what has happened post the report though, and what is quite promising is that the department has begun um, sending the commission notification of detainees who are about to reach the 120-day mark okay. and, and will be released. All right, we're going to have to take a short break. Let's just say, though, that we did invite the government to come and participate in this discussion, and they had agreed that they would be on our panel only to let us down at the last minute. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't have that voice here tonight. But if you do want to give us your thoughts on what we're talking about, do so on social media, Facebook at Interface on SABC2, or you can tweet us at Interface on SABC or at Tembi Samachele. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are talking about illegal immigrants, how they are kept in the country, and also the process of deporting them. And uh, we are chatting to Joe Very, who is a senior researcher at the African Center for Migration and Society, as well as Chantal Kassoun, who is the Gauteng Provincial Manager at the South African Human Rights Commission. Now, we, we would like to talk a little bit about the cost of uh, deporting these uh, immigrants. According to figures that we got from the department, uh, they say that it's, it costs around 200 million rand a year to deport immigrants, but they simply come back, most of them, uh, and you know there's very uh, huge challenges when it comes to what they do with them. Joe, what does a government do? Because you can't just let them be in the country, but at the same time, if you deport them at a huge cost, they still come back to the country. I mean, I think for starters, we need to understand who we're talking about, who's being deported and why. Um, and I think that a lot of the monitoring and investigation we've been involved in over the years clearly indicates that individuals who are being arrested, detained and deported for being illegal foreigners are not, are one, not always illegal foreigners. So we're having illegal deportations, illegal detentions taking place. Secondly, we need to understand why individuals might be um, seen to be currently undocumented. 
or irregular, or as, as, as you're using the language here, what we would call illegal. And I think we need to understand why that is. And what we sit with is a context where our Immigration Act is incredibly restrictive, which makes it very, very difficult for lower skilled workers, including informal workers, to regularize their stay, so to possess the correct documents. Mm. And we need to understand that, therefore, there is a group of individuals in the country who struggle, even though they're here, they're working, etc., who are struggle, struggling to regularize their stay. So we need to see who it is that's being but detained and deported. But why is that? Why is the government not fixing that? If you've got people who mm. are here legitimately mm. and are working, are contributing mm. to the economy of this country, why not take care of them? We're seeing an increasing, I mean, globally, we're seeing increasing securitization of national borders. And we're seeing national states choosing to increasingly securitize, make it much more difficult for individuals to enter a country. And this plays a lot into a lot of kind of persistent public rhetoric around assumptions around a high prevalence of individuals from other countries, assumptions that are completely unfounded relating to individuals coming and taking jobs from South Africans, for example, coming and preying on the state. We don't see that, and we have no evidence to suggest that. South Africa's home to around um, a similar proportion of cross-border migrants is globally. So around 3.3% mm. of the national population is a cross-border migrant. So we're only looking at a couple of million individuals within the entire country. However, through the way we discuss things in our public <coughs> and private spaces, the way the media reports, and how that often informs a lot of the discussions we hear through the state and parliament and so on. There is an assumption that there are all these individuals. And what we're seeing is individuals are coming to work. The majority are able to work, are, yeah. and many are able to access documentation. But there is a small number that struggle. Um, okay. And that's what we need to better understand. And there was a case uh, recently about the, the gentleman from Botswana who was detained, who was deported uh, uh, by the South African government and is now facing the death penalty in Botswana. Mm. Uh, and it was a wrongful deportation. Mm. What do we do in cases like those? I think cases like that and, and the kinds of perceptions that, that um, are taking root in society and unfortunate perceptions, in fact, which, which render more vulnerable groups which are already vulnerable to um, um, xenophobia and so forth um, are very worrying. Uh, South Africa has very clear commitments in terms of extradition. Um, what we're seeing in the form of complaints is also making it pretty clear to us that there are levels of engagement and intergovernmental relationships in terms of support functions by the SAPS, uh, in terms of primary um, functions by the Department of Home Affairs, where officials appear not to be sensitized enough. Certainly our research has not fully interrogated that, but the feedback that we had from respondents uh, in the interview sessions and research seemed to indicate that um, the SAPS, for instance, were holding people in excess of the 48 hours permitted under uh, the law, that they had not been informed adequately, or the large majority indicated they had not been informed Isn't adequately. Is a capacity problem, though? Because the number of people that come into the system or the, num the influx of uh, illegal immigrants, surely, relative to the number of police that we've got to deal with this matter. You're shaking your yeah. head. No. <laughs> is, is that not the case? Is it's it not, not the case. And I think that it's very easy to use that. Again, going along with this rhetoric that this idea that there are millions and millions of individuals crossing the border, coming here. You're saying there aren't. There are not. And we, we know very clearly that there are not. However, because that is a very strong public perception around that, it's the way that the media reports on it. And it's being allowed to influence the way in which policy decisions are being made, the way in wa ways in which policy is being implemented, and decisions that are being made on the ground by service providers. And we really need to work hard to counter that. Um, what are the stats? What are the numbers, if you've got them? So as I, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. right, just over 3%, 3.4% of the South African population is a non-national. So somebody born elsewhere... But how many illegal of those? Well, it's very difficult to obviously have sure. a true number. But what we have shown through all our smaller case studies is that the numbers are not, we often hear estimates of people saying sort of 3 million, 5 million, 4 million. No, we're clearly indicating that there are probably a group of individuals, but it's going to be a proportion of that sort of 3.5%. So if we're saying there's about 2.5 million individuals, there is a group that are going to be undocumented. But we have to refrain from considering this to be a group that is illegal. We have to refrain from perceiving this as a group who have somehow found a way to sneak across a border. 
As I mentioned earlier, our Immigration Act makes it very difficult for individuals who are seeking employment. Mm -hmm. And what we see is the majority of individuals who come seeking employment are able to find employment in an informal sector, are more likely to be suffering from abuse from employers. Um, for example, they have no protection under labor laws. Um, it's much easier to exploit them, so they're often paid far less than a South African mm. national. And they're also undertaking work that South Africans often don't want to undertake. But Joe, it's a catch-22 situation isn't it, for uh, a government, and you should tell as well, that you can't say, let's be a little more flexible around our border control and allow more people to come through into the country. At the same time, say, we've got too many of them that are illegal in the country, we've got to do something about it. And you've got the perception that you spoke about earlier where South Africans often think that the foreigners are taking their jobs. What does a government do <coughs> to try and the balance inherent, that? The inherent difficulty is, is um, exactly what, what Joe, Joe, the point Joe is making is that this is not a numbers discussion. This is essentially about the fundamental rights of human beings. They don't lose those rights by virtue of crossing our borders. Um, and our constitution is very clear that they are entitled to their basic human rights, inherent rights. And so regardless of the numbers, we have made commitments internationally um, in terms of our commitment to the uh, conventions and charters, civil and political rights and so forth, and indeed in terms of our constitution mm. to ensure that there is basic respect and protection for the rights of, of uh, non-national persons. All right, let's throw this one out to you. How do we do it as a society? How does the government do it where we are protecting the rights of uh, the migrants that are in the country as well as protecting the laws that are there in this country? Give us your thoughts on Facebook at Interface on SABC2 or on Twitter at Interface on SABC or at Tembi Samakhele. We have to take another short break. Do stay tuned. So just a quick look at some of the messages that have come through on Facebook and also on Twitter. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through everything as per usual. But Craig Sussman says, prevention is better than cure. Let us spend more money preventing illegal immigrants from entering the country instead of millions to detain and deport them. Leonard Paul Fantonar says, the Sadiq countries must pay for repatriation of their own citizens. Menzi Msueli says, I just think the problem dwells with unqualified individuals heading in institutions for the sake of having a black person in charge or a long-serving comrade benefiting. Not so sure about that one, but uh, he's talking about uh, the issues at Lindela and uh, at Home Affairs. But looking at what they've had to say, the prevention aspect, do we need to work harder to keep uh, illegal immigrants in particular from coming into the country? Do we need to tighten our borders more, Joe? No, it's absolutely not that. It's about looking at our immigration act. It's about looking at our immigration policies and better understanding what we're doing as a state that is resulting in a population of individuals who are undocumented. Um, as I keep iterating, you know, the, the population of non-nationals is much smaller than individuals assume. And we need to better understand why they're coming and what they're doing while they're here. The bottom line is that individuals are not non-nationals, are not a burden on the state. We know that it's a quite a small population. For example, we have 60,000 documented refugees in total. Mm. We have... Um, and in fact, uh, one of the stats I read was that the rejection rate for asylum seekers is 90%. Yeah, is it's that incredibly true? high. So South Africa does have a very high number of individuals who are seeking asylum. So these are individuals who are seeking a refugee status. But the rejection rate is very high, as you say. Um, but we cumulatively currently have only this sort of 60,000 population of documented refugees. But we have to understand refugees and asylum seekers are underneath the Refugee Act, mm. um, whereas legislation around immigration, which is where we've got individuals who are here working, individuals seeking employment, people who are here studying on work permits, on spousal visas, who are permanent residents, who are applying for citizenship, are governed under the Immigration Act. And it's the restrictions within the Immigration Act that make it very hard for lower skilled workers, whether we're looking at individuals working in agriculture, mm. individuals working as domestic workers, um, and other informal work. Now, 
Hearing what Joe is saying, Chantel, the perception that our borders are so porous, that we've got so many millions, in fact, of people crossing the border illegally, uh, if what Joe is saying is true, is that perception then true? Well, it, it's difficult to talk to a perception, but certainly um, the, a sentiment appears to be that, um, and, and you will see media reports, for instance, showing people getting through the border mm. and so forth. So I think that um, there are two sides to the story, that um, certainly uh, controls could be implemented in, in, a, in, in a more rights-based approach, to, uh, but um, I think the difficulty really is what people experience when they do enter the border, how efficient is the system, um, how long does an appeal take to be reviewed? How long are people detained? How are they treated when they do get into the mm. border? So what are the proposed solutions then for government? I mean, what are you as the South African Human Rights Commission saying should be done? Look, for the commission, what is critical is that there is respect for the Constitution and that there is respect for basic human rights. And what we've recommended to the state is that it, it takes um, immediate steps to correct the concerns, releasing people, for instance, who've been there for over 120 days, improving conditions within the center. But perhaps most significantly, what the Commission has called for is the implementation of a national preventative mechanism, okay. which is part of um, uh, an optional protocol to a treaty against torture. Uh, the mechanism, in fact, will allow independent monitoring of all places of detention and will allow the state to take corrective action. Okay. So these, these the, the different measures and recommendations that the Commission has made is aimed at sensitization monitoring um, and getting implementers to follow the law and follow the values of the Constitution. All right, we are running out of time. We've got to wrap it up very quickly. But uh, from your side, Joe, quick recommendations and proposals? I think there's three quick issues. One is that we need to understand the difference between the Immigration Act and the Refugee Act and who's governed under each. Secondly, we need to understand that the restrictions within the Immigration Act make it very difficult for a large population of individuals who are working in South Africa to maintain a regular status. And then finally, we need to understand what that then means for the way in which a space like Lindella is being used. Remember, Lindella is housing individuals who are assumed to be illegal foreigners. And that is a space that's governed through the Immigration Act. Mm. Um, so that you have a mixture of individuals in there, some who are currently asylum claimants, some who are South African and are deported. Um, we need to understand who's being deported and why. And as Chantal's mentioned, we then need to ensure that there is regular access and monitoring to ensure that rights are upheld in that space and that what's outlined in the relevant piece of legislation is being implemented. All right. Thank you very much, ladies. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you for shedding some light on this topic for us. And unfortunately, that's where we leave it for tonight. Thank you very much for taking part in this conversation. Remember that from Sunday, the 9th of November, we are coming to you live uh, on SABC 2 at 8.30 in our new time slot. Until then, good night. Thank you.